Hi everyone, this is Jenny Robertson, and I am welcoming you to the Real Women, Real Purpose talk show. We're live right here in the On Purpose Woman Global Community on Facebook. I am Jenny Robertson, like I said, and I am one of the hosts of the Real Women, Real Purpose talk show. Today I'm here with Felicia Barlow Clark, and we're going to be talking about the deaf positive movement, reclaiming our end of life. And I've known Felicia for quite a few years, but for those of you who don't know anything about her, let me tell you a little bit about her. So after experiencing the tremendous back-to-back -back loss of her beloved stepfather and sister, Felicia turned her pain into purpose, combining her experience in production with her deep spiritual journey and created epilogue tributes. She assists in creating personalized celebration of life ceremonies, giving those left behind the space to grieve. Felicia is a life celebrant and active in the death positive movement where she raises the awareness about the diverse end of life options and alternatives available. So welcome Felicia, so glad you're here. Thank you so much. Thank you said, we so we've known each a considerable amount of time and I'm so pleased and privileged to be part of your inaugural talk show. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad you're here because this is such an interesting topic. And I'm also wondering, before we actually start talking about the death positive movement, when you say that to people, do they give you, I mean, do people kind of like not sure they want to talk about it? You know, we really don't do death real well in this country. No, we don't. We're such a youth-centric country that people don't really want to talk about it. There's a little bit more opening up since the pandemic. I think we see a little bit more traffic and attendance in death cafes, but I think just the, even the, the terminology death positive movement, people kind of look at you like, what does that mean? Yeah, what's positive about death, right? Right. Well, let's start with that idea of death, death positive. Uh, what does it mean? It was actually started, I'd say like eight to 10 years ago by a woman who is a mortician out in California and she kept seeing all this stuff about the sex positive movement, about people not being ashamed to talk about their sexuality and everything. And she posted on Twitter, like, why are we not talking about death like in death positive manner? And that's what kind of started the whole thing. And she got a lot of people saying like, yeah, I'm not ashamed to talk about death or fearful. Wow, so sex positive, it started out as that. Or not really that, but just that was an idea. And if somebody said, well, we could do that with other things, including death. Yes. That's really interesting. So how did you come to do this work? I kind of stumbled into it after my sister and my stepfather passed away because I was already an event producer. I have like 25 plus years as an event producer and video producer. And so it, whenever there's a death in my family, it just sort of naturally falls on me that I'm the one that has worked with the funeral homes to collect mm -hmm. photos and work with the video and just kind of assemble everything. And it's just like a natural familial thing that, that has happened. And with my sister, my sister died a pretty tragic death. Mm -hmm. And I knew that she would not want to be remembered how she was the last few years of her life. She died of alcoholism, it was very mm -hmm. tragic. And she was the funniest person I think most people have ever met. She had that kind of comedy like Jim Carrey and Ellen DeGeneres, like just really out there. And I knew that that, was, that would be how she'd want to be remembered. So when I started thinking about how to do her service, I um, thought about all the old songs, country songs she liked. I put all of those into her service, worked with Reverend Jim Webb on her, her service. and. Mm -hmm. At the end, I asked her children what song they would like in her service. And they said, well, you know, she always made us listen to Shaggy's Mr. Boom Basket on the way to school and on, you know, on the way home. And she would send me the video of Mr. Bean dancing that, to that song all the time. And we would just laugh. And so at the end, we were like, okay, well, we're going to play that song because that's for her children. But I could hear, just hear her telling me the day before, she's like, you all have to get up and dance. Like, it's not just good enough that you play that song. You have to dance. So we, we kind of made a pact between the family that at the end we would all get up and dance, and we did. And you could just see the people in the room that knew my sister and knew her spirit light up and come and join us in the front of the room dancing. And so it really did turn into this complete celebration of her life. Wow, what a tribute to her. That is so beautiful. It kind of gets me. 
right here. But isn't that the way it, it should be, if there are any shoulds to it? I mean, we call it a celebration of life. And then we show up and it's all about, I remember going to one one time and nobody would say anything. They hadn't set up anybody to talk about the person in advance and nobody would say anything. And I didn't really know the person well enough to say anything. But yet I said, I stood up and I said, um, you know, I was only knew her a little, but every time I was around her and I was able to say something that was true. And then that kind of broke the ice a little bit because I think people just get real kind of self-conscious or something about that. But I think you need to plan that out, don't you? Like you don't want to just hope that people, and you want to have some, I think some things around it that says, you know, no 10 minute speeches, please. You know, that sort of thing. I love the idea. I want people to do that for me. I want them to, to have joy there, you know, a life well lived, no matter what happened, right? That's my whole business model. I'm like, let's turn it on its head and not make it about the morose funeral grief end of it, because that, I mean, quite honestly, kind of still pops up whenever grief, sadness, it just, it's going to be that way. There's a hole in my heart. Mm -hmm. um, so I really, truly believe that the celebration of life should be about telling that person's story. Mm -hmm. And I, I have that firm belief that, you know, we all come in with such a unique combination of our gifts, our education, our experience, our family, that we are so unique. Each one of us is so unique and that's what needs to be celebrated because there's only gonna be like one of us in like this one lifetime. That's so true, that is so true. And I, I like what you said about, you know, this doesn't mean that you leave and you feel great forever. It just means that in that moment when it most matters for this celebration, you can actually show the joy and the joy that she brought to all of you. And then the grief comes up and then you deal with it and then it comes up again and, and you, you, get, you get with it and, and all of that. And so I know you call yourself a life celebrant. So what does that mean exactly? How, how do you do that? Other than celebrate life, you know? Yeah, I think it's just what I said, like when I was trying to come up with a, you know, a title for myself, I did a little research and I said, well, what am I doing? I'm celebrating life. So mm -hmm. I'm a life celebrant. That. Is that like a typical name for people who do this kind of work? Or that's something that you just made up that fit you? Well, I thought I made it up, but when I okay. started researching it, you know, it was just, I think, just like intuitively guided because when I started looking it up, I was like, oh, there are people that actually kind of go to school to learn certain things. Because I was originally calling myself an end of life planning doula because I do that and I've been taking coursework for that as well. Mm -hmm. But it, it just didn't fit with me. I was like, no, life celebrate just seemed to. Yeah. yeah, that's too. That needs explanation. I think the other one, yes, like celebrant, does. just people can make up what they think it means, but it always it's always going to feel good. <laughs> I think you know. Well, let's go back a little bit because I know you and I've talked some about this whole idea of the um, of the death positive movement, but let's go back beyond how people used to do death. You said before the Civil War, there were some things that would naturally happen. What were some of those things? Before the Civil War, death was always handled in a family, like in the front parlor of the home. You would have a viewing. The community would come in and do their viewing. The community would help build graves mm -hmm. and build the caskets. But because of the Civil War and the logistics and with uh, men dying on the battlefield, they had to kind of change things up. And that's, I believe, when embalming became a practice because they had to transport the body sometimes, you know, pretty far. Yeah. And it just became a little bit more um, what, what, like strategized. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. the, the right word to use back then. And then from there, it, it, it's, it grew, grew and grew and grew into what is now what I call an industry. It got corporatized mm -hmm. and medicalized. And most people, you know, even though their desire is to pass away in their homes, they don't. Mm -hmm. They pass away with strangers. Yeah, yeah. And so we took all the heart out of it, I guess, didn't we? And the opportunity for people to honor, because what an honoring for someone to come in and care for a body, right? That, that makes me weepy because that is one of the things that I discovered that I didn't know about mm -hmm. when my sister passed. My mother and I spent so many years trying to save my sister mm -hmm. and that would have been a home body washing, would have been, I think the last like sacred ritual we could have done with her. And I had no idea that that was even an option because the funeral home 
never even told us that was something that is available. Are they, are any of them kind of getting with the times yet or in offering these things? Or would you as a life celebrant kind of intervene for the family with the funeral home and saying, here's what we want, here's what we'll be doing, right? Yeah. Okay. But most people aren't aware that at least in the state of Maryland, there's only two things a funeral home is required to do. And that's the death certificate and the transport of the body. And even the transport of the body can be questionable. It's just easier, like especially in our area with, you know, the DC, Virginia, Maryland, it's easier to have a funeral home do that because of mm -hmm. the borders. Yeah. But that's pretty much all they're required to do. Embalming is required though? Embalming is not required. It's not? See, I didn't know that. No. Yeah. Wow. That's very interesting. So really that is all they, they have to do. And they can transport, but they can transport port it to your home if you wanted. Correct. Oh, yeah. okay. Wow. Yeah, and you can still do <laughs> viewings at home and all that, even without the embalming. But of course, you, you know, it'd probably be like a one day versus a three right. day. Right. But a lot of people are choosing to be cremated these days. So that takes that issue totally away. And then you can do the celebration when it's a great time to do it. Correct. So and that is the reason why there is such a, I think, a, um, a schism right now is that you've got the funeral homes I think that still want to hold on to the old things that they know and that they know to do and then you've got a lot of practitioners now showing up that know that no you don't have to do it that way anymore mm -hmm. because cremations have risen so dramatically in the last few years and the industry the funeral industry has not kept up with that yeah I remember being so surprised when my parents told me they wanted to be cremated because they had when, when they lived in West Virginia, they had funeral plots. You know, you bought your funeral plots. They even had their tombstones already engraved with their birthdays and their names. And when they moved to North Carolina, I can remember we, we helped them move and the movers had left and I got, went out to the garage and there were these things like covered in moving blankets. And I took them off and it was their tombstones, these gorgeous marble, grand, I think they were granite tombstones. And I was like creeped out, you know, like, oh God, well, you know, well, we're gonna buy new plots down here. But at some point I remember my mother saying, um, we don't wanna take up any space. Why would we take up space? And that was quite interesting because, you know, my parents were born in the 19 teens, you know, 13 and 17. And that wasn't a common thing among I think people of that, those generations. Mm -hmm. And so it made, it made it very much easier for us then for what we were able to do for the celebration, you know, because we had time for family to come in. We had time to plan something that would sort of reflect who they are. Mm -hmm. So you're a life celebrant. So what do you most love about it? I, I've always been an advocate for like the, the animals for one, things that don't have a voice, children, animals. Mm -hmm. and that's how I feel with this. I feel like I am a voice for the death positive movement and opening up people's eyes to realizing like for one, you know, death is a natural part of life. It, it just is. And the more we talk about it, I think the more it gives us the privilege to really celebrate our own lives while we're living. We can go do things that, you know, we may not live tomorrow. We don't right. know. So I think it gives us that permission mm -hmm. to do that. But I really like just opening people up to this conversation about the reverence for life. Well, you're probably a really lovely person to have on hand when somebody is going through this. I imagine they get great comfort from someone like you who is, is coming from a different place than maybe, you know, in every funeral I've ever been to in a funeral home, they've always been, you know, very professional and very um, nice and very right on it and done the job well. But I've never had to, to deal with someone from, from you know, my loved one. I didn't have to make those arrangements for my loved one. And so I just imagine it would be wonderful to have someone that felt like was holding my hand through this and kind of hearing what I thought that the person wanted or what I knew the person wanted. So that must be very fulfilling. It is. And that is really my mission is to take a lot of those things off the family's plate so that they have that space to grieve, you know. That's yeah. the thing, you know, when you're thrown into a funeral at, you know, within a week after somebody passing, mm -hmm. there's so much to do. Yeah. So you're on the doing and not even feeling. Yes. And then that can come like a huge wave. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Surprise. Yeah. 
I remember, you know, you shared the story about your sister's service. And I remember um, at a meeting one time, you shared about the service that you did for your stepfather, who sounded like he was way, way a father um, for you. So talk a little bit about that service, because I think it's another great example of all the choices that we have on how to celebrate our loved ones. My stepfather was one of the most amazing people I've ever met. And he was a true pioneer in the city of DC. Um, during the mid sixties, you know, did so much within the civil rights movement. And anyway, his whole family did. Um, so his, I mean, that was a little bit tougher for me because I was so close to him. But one of the things that we did was his favorite color was red. And so we kind of just did, you know, the phone call, everybody wear red, you know, <laughs> he wouldn't want us all wearing black. Mm -hmm. And um, he and my mother were pioneers in, in marrying, in interracial marriage back in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we did, my family has a kind of goofy sense of humor too. One of the things that when the menus were going around the table at the funeral home, we were like, well, we've got to have the, the blondies and the brownies, you know, just as a little significant message. Food yeah. Wise. Wow. Yeah. And then again, of course, you know, I picked out all the pictures for his service and made sure that they sh showed what an important person he was, as well as the side of him that the people that did show up that had worked with him at one time had no idea. Like he, he had this silly side to him too. So you got to celebrate both sides with everybody. Yeah. Wow. I would imagine that just showing up wearing red would set a different tone. It did. Uh -huh. Yeah, and you could see, I, I know one of my friends came up to me, or gosh, it was a friend or a, a step niece or something that said, well, I didn't get the memo. Like nobody told me to wear red. I would have worn red. I was like, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I have black on today. <laughs> so let's talk about some of those options that people have for this time when they can't hold gatherings in person or large family gatherings in person, yet they may not want to wait however long we're going to need to wait to do that. What may be some options for people now? Well, one of the things I'm doing now is writing workbooks to help people do end of life planning. Nice. Great idea. That, yeah. And that's part of the death positive movement as well is to get people in action about planning their end of life, reclaiming their end of life, because most people leave it. 70% of the population leaves it for somebody else to decide oh. how the, the funerals or memorial service is going to be, you know, whether they're going to be cremated. A lot of really? people don't decide that. And then just simple things like you know, where their bank accounts are. Mm. You know, I'm, it just amazes me that it has been a part of our culture that we just don't deal with it. And it's not that hard, you know, really to sit down. My husband and I did a trust, gosh, probably 10 years ago to handle all these details. Mm -hmm. And that's the legal aspect of it. I'm gonna do something that's a little bit more the personal planning part of it and also planning their celebration of life. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people are like, I don't know what your favorite song is. You know, I don't even know what my mother's favorite song is. I know some of the ideas she wants for hers, but I need to sit down with her and go, okay, let's, you know, pick out your favorite photos and your songs and your color. So. Do you think there's just this still superstition that if we talk about it, it, it's going to happen. And if we don't talk about it, it won't happen. Is that what a lot of this is about, do you think? Definitely. There's actually a woman out in Arizona who for years, she, she calls herself the death doyon, doyon. And she, that's part of her line is, you know, it's like um, sex. If you talk about sex, you're not gonna necessarily get pregnant. And it's the same thing, so she <laughs> equates that to, you know, if just because you talk about death, you're not gonna die tomorrow. Yeah, there is this taboo around it. And I remember even, you know, trying to talk to my parents when they weren't, weren't sick and I didn't you know just to talk about is everything well you know our everything's you know they wanted me to be the executor and so they told me what I need to do where everything was who the lawyer was who was going to be handling everything but I said well what about a memorial service oh well, just do you, you girls will figure that out so it's almost like they also and maybe it was the generation they didn't think that they should that they should have anything to say about it or that maybe it'd be more of a tribute if other people did it. I don't know what was going on there, but I think a lot of it was, let's just not talk about it right now. You know, and I think it's really important. Don and I've had those conversations because I would not want to do something 
I, I think I know him well enough to know, but what if I did something that in retrospect, I go, oh, I think he would have hated that, you know? <laughs> I don't really want to be put in that position. So anything else you'd like to say about this? Because I just, I find it to be such a fascinating topic. Anything you'd like to add that we haven't covered? Well, there's so much to it. That's what I found like in the year and a half since I started doing this. You know, like I said, I, I took my event company and just niched it down to this. Like, you know, because I have- You're not doing any other events other than this now? Right now. Wow. Okay. And if something else came to me, like I, I do still broker entertainment. I've done that, you know, somebody singing on the National Mall. So I still, you know, accept business. But my marketing focus is on doing this because I just think it's so important. And like I said, the more I started doing research on it, the more I realized there is so much out there, you know, green burials, making your own casket. I have somebody in my um, business circle that is now thinking about doing woodworking shops to help families build, um, create their own urns for loved ones. There's, you know, different ways of things that you can do with ashes from mm -hmm. jewelry to planting it in a tree or in a coral reef. You know, there's uh, destination ash scatterings. There's so much virtual. And, you know, people mm -hmm. kind of talk about virtual like it's something new in terms of funerals. And it's not. There is a whole company out there that's been doing webcasting specifically for funeral homes for years. Mm -hmm. So it's not something new, but they're there's sort of this stigma around it with funeral homes even. So a lot of people are putting off doing their services because they don't want to do it virtually, which I can understand that because there is something about gathering in person, but it, it shouldn't be stigmatized at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, it um, seems like it might be, uh, I see it, it would be a great idea to go ahead and have something virtual, especially now and then have a celebration party or something to bring everybody together, mm -hmm. you know, to talk about that person down the road whenever we can. If Because it, it may not feel like they're, they're honoring them enough if it's virtual, mm -hmm. they want to wait. But I think about all the people that are waiting and how many funerals are going to be held like next year. Yeah. I can't imagine there's going to be funerals this year in anywhere in the country where you could have more than 10 people. Right. I'd be surprised by that. And yeah. so it's going to be like this, this, and then it's just massive kind of re, rethinking everything, redoing everything, mm -hmm. refeeling. Not that you haven't, not, not that you've stopped feeling, but just, just going through all that work, you know, that isn't necessary. At least I don't think it is. So I'm all for that because I think I can, I, you know, I can get into the let's make sure we do this right kind of thing and make myself nuts. So I really love that whole idea, Felicia. Thank you for doing this work. Yeah, and I have on some, some what I now call, and I, <laughs> I bought the domain name immediately when somebody said it to me, a Zoomeral. Um, yeah. Really? You bought the, that domain, domain I, I, still out there? I, a Zoomeral. It was, well, it wasn't. When I looked it up, there was somebody that has it, but they actually, it's regarding numbers. So I bought Zoomeral service and spelled two different ways, but I thought, I was like, that is so clever. It is clever. And I agree with you. Like, why not do something immediately? It's not expensive. And I've been on them and they can be so emotional. You know, when you do a candle lighting ceremony, mm -hmm. you know, have a, a officiant, you, know, you can do them the right way. And I would think that would also bring some peace to the family or the lo other loved ones because they're doing something now and not keep holding in their mind, oh gosh, we haven't been able to do anything yet. Oh no, I feel so bad that we can't honor our father or whatever. But you could do that now. And then at a later date, if you want to do something else, do something else. Have a potluck, you know, <laughs> just do right. something else. But I just imagine that would that would be a relief to some people to be able to do that. But right. I guess it's going to take a, a re-education and a reinvigoration of, of this whole death positive movement. Yes. I love it. So how can people find out more about what you do and get in touch with you? Well, my website is celebratingthedash.com for anybody that's ever read that poem out there called The Dash. Um, that's the life lived between birth and death. And that's what mm -hmm. my whole company is about is celebrating that life, that line. So my website celebratingthedash.com 
Um, there's information on there on all the different services I do from virtual services to pet services because I am, like I said, an animal advocate. And oh, I'm glad you brought that up. That's great. Yeah, I, I have my own little altar. In fact, the picture on my website is my altar of all my animals. So, uh -huh. yeah. Um, as well as the picture of all the little old black and white photos is my family's old black and white photos you'll see on there. But mm -hmm. um, I have all my different offerings, concierge services. If people don't know what to do, where to start, I did have a concierge company years ago. So very familiar with doing that. And so you think they could take you, you could take them right from the beginning of, I don't have a clue. Right. And walk them through some ideas that they might, might resonate with them. Yeah. Right. And there are a few companies um, popping up now, other people doing this, but I'd have to say the thing that sets me apart is not only do I have years and years of event planning experience, uh, or I, I, event production is bigger than event planning, mm -hmm. um, but also, like I said, I'm doing the end of life care doula, which is sensitivity training, mm -hmm. which I'm already an empath as it is. So this just helps me to understand the whole process of people going through hospice and what is kind of expected at the end of life to help okay. people. Would you work with anyone? Could a family call you in for that purpose as well to be with their loved one or to just sit with them with their loved one and maybe talk about some things or would that just be left up to hospice? Like I, I know a lot of end of life doulas, that's part of the death positive movement as well. Mm -hmm. People that actually do that, I could do that. And I have done that with my own loved ones and like my mother's best friend. It's not something I, want to do though right, right. It doesn't feel like my calling mm -hmm. but I certainly know plenty of people you know because I do help co-host the Annapolis Death Cafe like the woman that I work with she is a lovely person that does that the Annapolis Death Cafe which is coming up tomorrow night 6 30 on and Zoom. what is that say more about that then death cafes were started in 2011 in England by a person you know wanting to talk about death and not making it a grief counseling group or morose or anything, just people that have this natural curiosity about mortality and or grief or, or life and wanting to talk about it. So the only rules are that you drink tea, of course it's English, eat cake and not have an agenda. There's no speakers, mm -hmm. no agenda. So it's just a group mm -hmm. of conversation. It's a discussion. Uh -huh. Is it open to anyone who wants to come or? Yeah. yeah. In right. fact, on deathcafe.com, because everything's on Zoom right now, you could go to one in England if you wanted to. Okay, so deathcafe.com. Thank you for that. That's fascinating. I want to have to definitely show up for one of those. So it looks like we're about to wrap up here then, right. Felicia. Thank you so much for being with me today and for talking about this death positive movement. I know a lot more than I did when we started. And <laughs> I just think it's, um, I think it's going to open the door up for other things, other creative ways to do things that we've had all these rules around yes. and to kind of rethink the rules for the 21st century a bit. So thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I and I want to thank all of you for joining us for the Real Women, Real Purpose talk show live in the On Purpose Woman Global Community Facebook group. And if you want to see a list of all of the interviews we have scheduled, go to the On Purpose Woman magazine. That's www.onpurposewomanmagazine.com. And you can look in the table of contents for the Real Women, Real Purpose um, talk show and look for all of our interviews there. Also, if you love this interview and you want to share it with your friends, you'll find it on our YouTube channel in less than 48 hours, probably. And that YouTube channel is the On Purpose Woman Global Community. So go over there, please. We just started it last week. So please go over there and subscribe. We already have six interviews up there for you to see. This interview will be up by this time tomorrow. And um, that way you won't miss anything. You can always go over there and see what you might have missed if you didn't catch it on the community group. And we're gonna have two more interviews, interviews for you this week in the On Purpose Woman Global Community Group. Tomorrow, Catherine Yarborough will interview Judy Harvey. And Judy will talk about everything you wanted to know about hiring an editor and were afraid to ask. And that happens at noon Eastern time. And then on Thursday, I'll be interviewing Maria Petrucci. This will be at two o'clock Eastern time. And Maria will be sharing three simple healing principles. So you wanna be sure to go over and subscribe on our YouTube channel, On Purpose Woman, no, let me back up. The On Purpose Woman Global Community um, YouTube channel. Just go over there and type that in and it will pop up. Subscribe there and that way you can go over it anytime. 
and you can share that with your friends and you can go over there anytime and see the uh, interviews that you might have missed. I think that's it for now. Again, thank you, Felicia, for being with me. I'm Jenny Robertson, and I'll see you in another interview, I hope. Thank you.